So good evening. Uh, I'm Robe Imbriano. Uh, I am the uh, Ira Lippmann Professor and Director of the Lippmann Center for Journalism and Civil and Human Rights. Um, this uh, is uh, the first event uh, that we are uh, staging this semester, which I'm very excited about. And I'm very excited to have Julian and Terrence and Nina here tonight. Uh, you're in for a very remarkable night. Not only are we going to show a really terrific film, uh, but we have both the filmmaker and the subject and star of the film here uh, in conversation with a professor who, who here who worked on the film. Uh, so it's 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 going to be really great. We'll have a few minutes uh, at the end uh, for uh, questions. We're going to show the film, take five minutes to stretch. Then they'll come up, uh, we'll do a little uh, conversation, and then a little Q&A. And after that, you'll also have the opportunity to uh, buy uh, one of Julian's books uh, in the back. Um, so let me give a little introduction uh, before we begin. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank the team of the DART Center for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, thanks to Mindy Myers and the Lippmann Center's Dolores Barkley and Ali Raj, uh, Carlos Del Rosario, all of whom have played a vital part in organizing this event from the video tech down to the snacks in the back of the room. Uh, there's still some there, so please help yourself. Um, let me introduce everyone. Julian Rubenstein is a journalist, author, and documentary filmmaker. He reported The Holly over eight years. Uh, in a gentrifying community in Denver, where a misunderstood gang shooting case became a window into the political machinations of urban development, policing, and the city's gang activity. The film premiered on Stars and Apple Plus in 2023 and was selected by the International Documentary Association to play in its Fall Docs series for Oscar longlisted films. The book was a New York Times editor's choice and winner of the 2022 High Plains Book Award and Colorado Book Award. His first book, Ballad of the Whiskey Robber, was a New York Times editor's choice and a finalist for the Edgar Allan Poe Award. He is a visiting filmmaker at Western Colorado University, and we're all proud to say a 1992 graduate of the Columbia Journalism School. Yeah, 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 yeah. Terrence Roberts, standing next to him back there, is a nationally recognized activist and former mayoral candidate based in Denver. Third generation resident of the historic Park Hill community, he was co-leader of the Justice for Elijah McClain movement, which resulted in charges and convictions of police and paramedics for the death of McClain and changes in Colorado laws governing police accountability. Before he was an activist, he spent more than a decade as a gang member and almost 10 years in prison, after which he returned to his community and founded Prodigal Son, a nonprofit serving at-risk youth, which won multiple awards and led to his selection to the GRIO 100 in 2010. Three years later, he was attacked by gang members, some of whom actually worked for the police in a case that is dissected in tonight's film, The Holly. And Professor Nina Alvarez, is a journalist, documentarian, and video photographer for over 25 years. She has reported breaking news and feature stories from around the world on broadcast and web segments, radio reports, and long form documentaries. She is the CBS Assistant Professor of International Journalism right here at Columbia Journalism School. So, I'm going to get out of the way with no further ado. The Lippmann Center and Dart Center present The Holly. Hey, well, you made it to the end. Thank you. Um, well, I was I was involved in the making of the film, so I am a little biased, but I think it's pretty compelling to the last frame. And so I'm really, really thrilled to have Julian and Terrence here to talk about it from a journalism perspective. Um, we've 
gone to film festivals. I've seen you guys talk about the content of the film, but I'd really like to focus tonight on the process, the journalism, as well as from a source's perspective, like, why would you talk to this guy to begin with? Um, so yeah, let's start right from the beginning. Okay, Julian, I've known you a long time. You were here living in New York City. You had just written a, another incredible book, right? The Ballad of the Whiskey Robber. And I recommend that highly as well. Um, and then you you call me and you're like, I have to make this movie. I have to make this movie and here's what it is. And it, you just went into this like that I think I caught maybe like two or three sentences and I was like, okay, break this down for me. So tell me about that moment. How did this story come to you? How did you decide this is a story I'm, you probably didn't think it was gonna take eight years. Maybe you thought it was gonna take a few months, but you said, I need to go and do cover this. Tell me about that. Um, okay, great question. Um, and thanks, Nina. And thanks for working on the film and for doing this and the Lippman Center and the Dart Center. I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, you know, so I was living in New York, as you know, and um, I, because I grew up in Denver, I'd always had this idea, like, I'm going to go back to Denver and do a big story or something, but I never found a story to do. And um, I was reading the New York Times, actually. And there was a sort of a news feature story about the shooting. And um, and that was in the fall of 2013. Um, so I read it around then, but I read it online. I don't know when exactly, but around then. And, um, and then it was a few months later, <clears throat> like pretty much about 10 years exactly from this month that I flew out to Denver. Because in the story, I mean, there was enough. I mean, it was too early in a obviously a complicated case but like it did raise some of the interesting issues about the neighborhood and like the violence that had been there the gang violence the sort of a little maybe a little bit about the history of the neighborhood but I think not even that much and then just some questions about what happened and Terrence's previous work so it was already enough for me to be like interested in what happened to someone who seemed perhaps to be a guy who was coming out of the system and really you know, succeeding and making a difference. And then what happened, but he seems to have shot someone at his own peace rally. And it was really turning, you know, over a lot of things in Denver, just people were upset and like, it, it didn't actually look good at all for Terrence, but I did decide to look for him online and uh, found a number and or an email and from his original, um, a, a nonprofit prodigal son and I wrote to him hoping I might hear back and then um I did hear back and I mean that's what you know got it started I don't know if uh Terrence what did you say in your... that. well I, I last just about like that I I was and that I thought it's not a very interesting that I was interested in kind of more hearing more about you know what happened and him and whatever and that I would love to talk to him and, that, and that's what I asked Okay, so Terrence, you get this email. You're looking at attempted murder charges. And you get this email out of the blue saying, your story sounds interesting. What's your, what are you thinking then? So um, I was actually getting hundreds of emails from like local journalists and maybe some national. I didn't look at all of them. I was just deleting, 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 deleting. Um, because they were harassing me, they were harassing my family, they were harassing my neighbors. Um, like I was watching the news and my neighbors were on the news. I'm like, what is she doing on the news? <laughs> and she, her and her husband are on the news talking about me. Um, okay, lesson number one to budding: be nice to your neighbors. <laughs> Don't harass the neighbors. Um, they were interviewing people who knew me that live way outside of Denver. They were just popping up at people's houses if they thought they knew me and were interviewing them because I wasn't talking to them. So what made the difference? Like, it's well, an email. Well, like, first I seen his name and it's like Julian Rubenstein. So it's like a little bit different from Denver. So then I like, I was like, oh, he's like, well, I'm in New York City. Like, you know, uh, 
I read about this in the New York Times, so I Googled him. Like, let me see who this guy is, because I needed someone outside of Denver to give me a voice, because all of the journalists in Denver, sadly enough to say, I feel still to this day, are still too tied into the machine. It's like they're all friends. They all party together. They all date each other. They divorce each other. They're hanging out. They don't like each other. They love each other. They're all just friends. They're like, and they were all tied into the mayor's office. And I was very critical of the mayor, very publicly critical. He's like this young, handsome African American mayor where no one wanted to criticize him because not only was he popular, but bad things could happen to you. It's very corrupt in Denver. I've seen worse than Denver. <laughs> It's very corrupt in Denver. You will starve. You will not be able to pay your rent if you're on the outs with the machine. Um, and so when I seen that he was from outside of Denver, I had nothing to lose, I felt. So I was like, I don't have a reason not to talk to him. I didn't have anything to hide. Like I knew everything about me was not perfect or pretty, but I didn't feel like I had to like stuff this away or hide from journalists. I just didn't want to talk to local journalists because they were going to throw me under the bus, but I needed to get my voice out. And I, I thought it was great that somebody outside of Denver wanted to do it. So I was like, sure, as long as you're going to, like, I don't need you to do me any favors. Even the bad stuff about me, just just tell it. I'm not ashamed of myself. And and once I felt like he could do that, I was like, I don't mind talking to you because they had the literally the same gang members who a witness literally told Julian they were in his shop, called me a snitch, told a bunch of active murderers to murder me because I was supposedly a snitch while he's working for the police. He was in the news criticizing me while I was sitting in jail for defending myself on an attack. He planned on me. Then he's in the news criticizing me. So after I seen that, I was like, I don't care what my attorney says. Okay. Now we're, we're get, you're getting ahead of the, get, you're getting ahead. Cause I'm going to get there. Yeah, okay. Okay. But so you got the call and then you talked. And I remember the first trip. I actually was on that first shoot. And I mean, if the request was, can I follow you around for the next eight years with a camera? Uh, what would you have thought? I probably would have said no at that. Um, but once Julian got involved, you know, and the reason why I wanted Julian involved because he wasn't going to do me any favors because I didn't need any favors. I guess I'm not a perfect person, but I was innocent and I'm, I'm not ashamed. I try my best to live with as much integrity as I can where I don't have to hide anything from journalists. It's like, sure, do a story on me. Like I'm not stealing money from my nonprofit. Like if there was times I couldn't pay my rent, I, had, I couldn't pay my rent or I had to be a few days late. Like that's nonprofit life. I would have $50,000 in my nonprofit account that was not my money and I couldn't pay my rent. And my wife at the time would be like, you have like 55,000 in the bank. I'm like, it's not my money. She like pay the fucking rent. You know what I'm saying? We have to wait a few days. So I never stole money. Um, so I didn't have anything to hide. I, I was happy Julian wanted to get involved outside of Denver's journalism. I really was actually. So this is interesting because here's Julian. He probably didn't grow up in Park Hill, right? He was from Denver. He was familiar with the place in a kind of a general kind of way. Did it ever dawn on you like, okay, is is a white guy going to get what's going on here? I mean, and I've said this several times, like, I wish a young strapping African-American journalist would have done my story, but I'm not from New York. Like, I'm not from Los Angeles. Like, the story's in Denver. Within any African-American journalist that are in Denver, if they would have done this story the way Julian would have, they would have been blackballed, they would have been threatened, and it would have been a totally different story because being an African-American journalist in Denver, for one, you would have been one of thousands of maybe Caucasian journalists. There's not very many African-American journalists. And for two, they would have been swayed by that machine, or they probably even would have lost their career. You know, so um, I, when you talk about stuff like journalism, I, I don't care if you're white, black, Indian, Latino, like, are you going to get the story right or not? Like if black people are waiting for black people to tell all the black people's stories, that's a lot of black stories that won't be told. For one, black journalists will be overwhelmed. There's millions of black stories that need to be told. And for two, I care about journalism, <laughs> not if someone's black or not. And obviously I needed Julian to cover this story the way he did. So um, I wasn't tripping on him being white. 
it wasn't even a topic about him being white until the people who had me attack brought up the fact that he was white and he's Jewish and these different things. Other than that, no one in Denver has ever said anything about white journalists until it showed their deeds. Then it was the thing. So I, I wasn't I wasn't caring about his skin color. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, Julian, what story did you think you were going to tell, and how was that any different from the story that we saw on the screen? I mean, at first, I mean, I had a pretty good idea that the so the there there was first the book and how I was going to tell that. And, you know, came first, by the way, was there a book deal or was there a, it was by the time I got like probably the contract I was probably had maybe was around the time that we filmed that first scene because I was already reporting on it. Um, and it was, had become clear to me sort of pretty soon that some of the, that the story, first of all, was just very much alive, you know, that it was not kind of like. I'm going to report on this story that happened, the shooting, this community, and then the coming up will be the trial. Like there was a lot going on, you know, and that ended up being the entire like bulk of the movie and the third act of the book. Um, but uh, and and when that was happening in front of me, um, that was when I realized that I thought there was a potentially, you know, really interesting documentary because of that access I had during that time. Um, but in terms of the like, you know, what Terrence said and some of the conspiratorial type of things he was saying to me early on was definitely an intrigue, but obviously had a long way to go to being even, you know, sussed out, understood in many ways. A lot of times he would say stuff I didn't even know what he was talking about, but I'm like, that sounds really interesting, but I have no idea even what you're talking about. Some of it sounded crazy. Yeah, like I didn't. And but a lot of it and the and what it did do, though, was sent me on. It, like put my antenna up even further to anything that I was gathering in my interviews. And frankly, it was a lot because it was a lot of people who are also saying those things. And some people actually had even firsthand evidence as one person ended up who I protected in the only scene in the whole movie. That's a recreation actually, because of this person's, you know, safety that I wanted to protect. But, um, you know, and because he was a very credible witness um and um and then just other you know other other things that you know i guess by you know by doing the film i was able to capture certain things that were happening in real time and i thought would have i didn't know of course where honestly a lot of it was going during a lot of that time but i thought that because of the history of the neighborhood because of the cycles of things that had gone on there in the past and frankly were also often misreported or misunderstood. And now here I was firmly witnessing something like that again, that was also being misreported, definitely misunderstood and totally shady and trying to figure out what was going on. I thought all of that really was going to provide a lot of material to, you know, follow and see how it played out. So I, that, those themes, a lot of them were very kind of apparent, but where it would go, I wasn't, you know, really sure. Right. That's reporting. Um, and on that first shoot, you interviewed a lot of people. You interviewed Reverend Kelly. At that point, he seemed to be like a good guy. So what happens, What where where do you start to see that there's something else happening and how do you pursue that? And so you know, I have to think, you know, honestly, straight away when I think about the question, I have to be honest that um, among the people from whom I face potential danger, I would definitely pick Reverend Kelly at the top of the list and that's not a joke. Um, and uh, so, but you must say, you know, because the direction you know, the math of the film has been, I guess, not surprising, perhaps, but, but it's been sort of outrage, I guess, and one other thing is saying, I don't know you're reading, okay. Um, and, you know, there's one of my people that I remember, you know, going down an offer to be interviewed, you know, and I don't know the names, but I guess I would just say that. You know, one of the main things I, I feel about Reverend Kelly is he was the perfect, you know, in which 
they were revealed themselves as the story goes on. And you just know that I was constantly sending these things. Sometimes on the phone, and I had to go through a lot of legal work to make sure I could get those uh, phone calls into the movie, for example. And this is in the book as well. And I don't know, you know, longer than I'm through for them, but just uh, to me, I feel like he very much wrote himself as saying who he was, you know, saying everything publicly, saying a completely different thing to me, including the like, threats and you know, his, um, clearly closely associated with not only with the police, but like the police who were involved with doing problematic things, but also um, he was extremely close by his own, you know, description. And I think he said that he basically Carl McKay is the center of this is, was like a son who I'm from over the last 30 years or something and I was extremely close to him. And it just became frankly incredible to me that Reverend Kelly didn't know a little more than he was saying. You know, he went on um, to testify the way he did, frankly, because he it was so obvious what he knew to himself. You know, like he, but he, like many people, thought Terrence was going to be going to prison on the gun charge. This is a small wrinkle in the case that well, we haven't addressed in the film, but it's just a chance a lot of people thought was going to go to prison because of the mandatory violation of, uh, I think it's called a palpa, like a previous offender with a weapon or a possession of a weapon with a, by a previous offender or whatever the acronym is. And that... He wasn't that, allowed to have a gun. He, right, because of previous felonies, convictions. And he nonetheless obviously beat the case and his lawyers were smart enough to bifurcate the case and the jury never heard that charge because they uh, initially anyway because you know tunes had he not testified wouldn't have had to disclose anything about his past and the jury wouldn't have known it he, he did testify about it but the lawyer were told that this last charge existed but he had just of course been exonerated and uh found not guilty and obviously because of self-defense. So they, I think the, the prosecutors immediately agreed at the bench, um, probably not happily, but to, to, to drop that final charge and not put him in prison for defending his life. Um, so anyway, he was, um, you know, it, it was, yeah. Let, let me, let me, let me take you back a little bit because now you're talking about the legal strategy and all of that, but one thing that was remarkable was you had a camera in these sessions where Terrence is consulting openly with the lawyers. How did you get that to happen? Lawyers are always like, please don't talk to the media. <laughs> please don't. When you see a camera, run the other way. So how did how did that come about? Well, Terrence came in. So he wanted, he basically demanded it, which of course I was pretty happy about, but... <laughs> I mean, like I told my dad, like, uh, I'm looking at life in prison, like, I don't have anything to lose. I was, I can't fight 25 blood. <laughs> it's just not possible for, for anyone. Bruce Lee, no one can fight 25. And a lot of these guys weren't children. These guys were 25 years old, 23. Like, these guys were dunking basketballs. I'm 5'11". Some of these guys were 6'5", my size, a little shorter. Like, these are grown men. So it's like, I have nothing to lose. And I was on my own property. I was leasing the property and I had about $200,000 worth of equipment on the property that my company owned. I was doing what I was supposed to do. So I had no issues with Julian being there or talking to the media. What did the lawyers tell you? Did of the lawyer were like, shut the hell up. Like you're, you're going to prison. <laughs> just take this 20 year deal. Just shut up. Take your deal. Who were they saying about? Shady Julian. They hated Julian, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> they did not want Julian around because they were trying to do a good job for me. You know, of course. So I wasn't upset with them for what they were telling me, but I was just like, I was a problem client. Like, I really was. It was a very public case, but I was already looking at life, so I wasn't like, I'm just going to be quiet. Just whatever they say, it's like, no, they're slandering me in the media, so I'm going to unslander myself. So it was, it was... They were upset with me for having Julian in the room. Yes, but very Ma upset. But Marshall, who's ultimately, you know, was a lawyer that wanted me to do it. And so 
one of the many conversations on when we came back and it said he was going to offer him a contract for one dollar for the, the official vineyard for, for Terrence, and that I could bring that evidence, but the material was Terrence's. Uh, you know, he owned that and he could do what he wanted with it if he wanted to give it to me. And that's how I did it. I want to add this though. So Marshall retired after my case and they gave him a framed article of me winning that. Mind you, he's been an attorney for, for decades, but for his parting gift from the Colorado Public Defender's Office, they gave him a framed article of my case. So that was pretty cool. It's like, they didn't want me talking. But then we win. And it's like, that's his gift. So I love Marshall. And Tyrone actually represented me, the, the African-American attorney, when I was arrested in 2020 for protesting. He represented me pro bono. So he got my charges dismissed. But you didn't have a camera then? No. No. Well, there were other cameras that oh. filmed, but not for the doc. Okay. Well, I'd like to open it up for questions. So if anyone wants to, is there a mic? for? Okay, great. But in the meantime, Terrence, were you worried about how, were, was there any scene in the film where you were like, oh, I can't believe they filmed um, that. I can't believe they put that in the cut. I feel really bad about yelling at my dad the way I did. Cause like that was my right hand man. And if you see him in the film, he was literally always on my right side. <laughs> and that was on purpose. Cause he's always like, I'm your right hand man. Um, and my dad passed away and like, he was just always so positive to me and just like such a good person. He's like one of those people you could call at three o'clock in the morning and you'd be like, what are you doing? Pops, he'd be like, I'm up, man. What are you doing? Knowing he's asleep, right? Um, he's just a good spirit, a good person. Not just because he was my dad. He's just a really encouraging person. So um, I felt bad about how I treated him sometimes throughout that because I was disrespectful to him as my father. And that's probably about the worst part. Other than that, like, I know I wasn't mentally or physically healthy during that time. Um, so I don't really like the way I depicted myself, but it, it has nothing to do with Julian or the production. That was all what came out of my own self, you know? So, um, I'm happy with the film and, and I think Julian did a great job because it was what it was, you know? So. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, uh, Julian is my classmate actually from 92, class of 92 Columbia journalism. So, uh, Milton, Milton Alimadi. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, showing and demonstrating the power of journalism, really. And the sad thing is, you know, how many other compelling stories are there that will never be told? Because, you know, we don't have somebody who's willing to dedicate that time. And uh, so, and, and, and at, the, at the end of the film, when they were showing that they poured $20 million, and I'm saying, why don't they use that money? for job creation and job training. But anyway, how long did it take you to develop that rapport with Terrence? Because I know in a story like this, you're listening to him say a lot of stuff and you want him to get the impression that you believe him, but I'm sure you don't know him. So there are times that you're questioning what to believe until it starts connecting, right? And for you, Terrence, I mean, it's sad the way they drove you out of that community when you were really doing a grass level, grassroots uh, uplifting, you know. I hope you find a way to get back into that. Uh, but question to you is, uh, at what point did you also develop that trust to be open uh, with, uh, with Julia? And what did it take? What made that, you know, click, that connection? And at some point, were you also doubting that maybe he's also a snitch? <laughs> I'll start first. Well, there was a moment, right? There was that moment in the film where you got. We I got read. several moments. I know. Just, you just know, that was, know. You know, it was not the worst, but you were you were pissed. You were so angry because he went and talked to Hassan's pals, yeah. right? And and so, talk about that. Like, what? No. How did that? And it was it was at that moment after that when I was yelling at Julian and we kind of had a separation. And he talked to me. It was like. Like, look, Terrence, like, this isn't your story, only your story. Like, I'm not just covering your side. Like, I need to hear from both sides because, like, he had been talking to me so much. I was kind of thinking, like, oh, he's my reporter. Like, they're your reporters. <laughs> channel 7, Channel 9, they belong to you guys. This is my reporter, right? 
But then he had to be like, I no. Think they might have thought that too. Yeah. We talked about that. Yeah, but but Julian explained to me like, yo, if I find out something bad about you, if you're smoking crack, if you're selling drugs, if, you, if you're doing things you're not supposed to do, it's going in the book. And that's when I trusted him. That's when I was like, good. That's what, because I'm not smoking crack. I was not selling drugs. That's what I need to hear. And it was after we had that moment when he explained to me, like, yo, I'm a journalist. I don't work for you, Terrence. I'm not your, your reporter. Like, I, whatever comes out of you, whatever comes out in the story, just, just, just know it's going in there. And after I heard that from him, I was actually more at ease by that because they have a lot of things to hide. I would sound crazy again if I told you everything that they have to hide, but they have a lot of things to hide all the way up to rapes and homicides while getting grant money from the city of Denver. So um, once he said that, I was I was more at ease with him when he explained that he was not working for me. That's what I needed him to hear to say. But, but and that was a lot of tension. It wasn't it, it, it did ebb and flow, I feel like in that in practical terms for journalists, it's kind of like which I'd never encountered, by the way. Working on books or magazine articles, I'd literally never once even, I, I, I've i now kind of realized I should even do it for those. But I've never gotten like release forms and all this stuff, but in a documentary, you have to get them or you should get them. I didn't even have all of them. And that, then you have to go through, you know, some legal considerations, but, um, I, you know, you should have them. And when, you know, because of that question and because of the representation question, that's really been, you know, percolating a lot obviously over the last several years which may, did make it challenging in terms of making this film even not from the community standpoint interestingly but sometimes from the grant standpoint it actually was harder and the idea i heard feedback sometimes that a white person shouldn't do this story about this black community um so but in this case you know i think with terrence that the question of whether or not it, that what had also percolated was the question of like whether or not Terrence would maybe be a producer on the film, for example, or which I was told sometimes by grant, um, you know, associations or oh, people hell. connected to them or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and which, you know, I just felt in this case, like it was very hard. I went through a lot of different, you know, feelings about it because at first I was sort of, you know, even like mad basically, because I felt like I was risking my life for this story that was going to, you know, actually tell things about what it, most of these organizations want to do but like um of course i had to really just whatever try my best to understand all those issues too and it did it did slow things down and there were times when it felt very urgent and you know the fundraising was such a big part of it um but but definitely i ultimately we it came to a head a few times with terrence where i really did say that I just didn't feel comfortable with this film, not to say that it's not possible with another kind of film, it's just like any kind of journalism or, 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 or film or whatever, there's many, many kinds of it. And this was, I felt more journalistic, investigative, and I wanted to protect that. And so um, when, and he would say like, I, I have nothing to hide. And I remember saying something along the lines of that, I thought, good, well, then you're gonna thank me later when, it's an independent film and it's not going to, but I did investigate Terrence. I mean, and honestly, I'll, I'll just I, more than anyone, I didn't say, I'm not saying I even investigate him because of something I, whatever, I, I, there were all kinds of, and Reverend it's Kelly was among diligence. them. He, he, due diligence. And there were weird things being said about him that I thought were obviously untrue because I was around him a lot. And there were clearly things being said to undermine him and to, whatever well, that similarly that they've been said about the book when it's come out there's been tons of falsehoods put out about it to kind of like you know take away from the actual truths in it but um i want to move on to the next okay. question so go Good ahead evening. tell us your name hi i'm zisa ziza so glad to be here tonight uh, i wrote down my thoughts so i hope it'll be concise um this film was emotional dynamic and phenomenal uh, the epidemic of violence and the war on drugs appear to converge as tools of systemic oppression. It made me think of some connections between the police force, access to loans, business development, and quality schools as culpable and committed to, to systemic neglect, which creates an environment that becomes a war zone, such as what was depicted. 
For example, during the Biafran genocide in Nigeria, of which the Igbos were the target, the British provided the weaponry for that, for that destabilization. Similarly, the Taliban and, and Hamas received funding from the same corporations and their lobbied governments, like the Bloods and the Crips. There are a few conspiracies, but a plethora of coordinated agendas to perpetuate, I'm almost done, and sustain- I just want to have a question. I do have a question. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll land on a question. From my, from my assessment, I believe the world hosts multilateral wars manufactured by entities without allegiance to life, liberty, or justice. Racism is a decoy of war. The effects are not a conundrum, but a custom. We may have lost Nipsey, but Terrence is still here. My last question, or only question. Julian, does, ter uh, does Terrence receive any proceeds from your book? Okay. Well, so I was just going to say, um, agreeing with what you, know, you, you said, I think the story ended up being really a much of, a, of a, a story about structural racism. But I mean, specifically on the question, did we want to say 20% of proceeds you your beginning, right? We had no royalty check, yeah, frankly, no, but, um, because of the way publishing yeah. is, but yes, I do agree um, that he would get, and he's also probably only helping him in terms of the intellectual property, um, if I were to send them for a movie, that would be 50% each. Um, and I was always able to, was happily able to pay him for, even though I didn't want to pay him for being a source, I paid him for the archival, or rights to his archival footage. And by the way, I just have the rights. I, I, don't, um, I don't own it. He owns it. But I wanted the right to show it in a movie. And I think that that footage was amazing and incredibly dramatic and was part of the reason I decided I had to do the movie. You, you probably remember the scene on Clarence at the beginning of this movie. At least, by the way, are dead. But so much of that footage that captured the work Clarence was doing before the shooting I thought was incredibly important to the story. And so, and by the way, on top of that, we have been able to thankfully make a little bit of money, not a lot, but even coming here and yeah. being from here and to and to be here and to talk to you. And actually, a lot of events, sometimes we get the little money, and sometimes we get just a little bit of money, and sometimes I get a thousand bucks or something. And I'm setting up a town to open up and make a little extra money that way. So that's how it's worked. I want to add to that just really quick. Um, don't think that I don't understand racism, journalists depicting black people and Latino people and people of color in ways that are very racist. Don't think I don't understand that, even though he's a white journalist and, and I trust in him. Um, but I'm very happy with not being a producer. I really needed this to be a story outside of because the whole thing in Denver would have been it's only Terrence's narrative. And they still try to push that. But no, it's not my narrative. This is an independent journalist. And it just so happens I did not go to prison or they didn't murder me. That's why I'm sitting here right now, because he could be here by himself. Or I could have been like F Julian and he could have been like, all right, well, the story's done. I'm going to Columbia by myself. If you don't want to go, fine, because I'm going to go. Um, but I'm very happy with how it turned out. I have not made a dollar off the book. I'm not worried about that. I, I, I have a job. I'm a property inspector. Uh, I'm able to pay my own bills. Um, and I'm happy that I'm not a producer. I don't need a producer credit but yet I'm sitting in the penitentiary, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or they're spinning other five different documentaries saying, well, that was only Terrence's side. Let's tell this other slander aside. So how everything turned out, um, I'm very, I'm very happy with it. Okay. All right. Tone. Tone, yeah. Um, first of all, great job. It was awesome. I just have two questions, one for each. Since you kicked the hornet's nest, you know, both politically and on the streets, what's next? Um, so right now I'm, I'm a property inspector. I, I do GSA buildings, government buildings, courthouses. I actually just inspected the DEA building in LA. They did not want to let me in the building, but I got in the building because I have my certifications and I'm cleared for GSA buildings. Um, we're getting to cut it short. Um, but, um, and I'm helping with small productions actually. Um, you know, since this, has come out, people are like, yo, Terrence, can you help me with this or that? And I've helped people get funding for their own films um, from some of my donors and funders to tell their story, how I told mine. So I'm helping with small productions, not big ones. I know you guys have done big product productions and I'm just working in. I've turned vegan. This, this is not leather. <laughs> I know, though. Thank you, leather ever. <laughs> but, um, I'm just trying to get healthy. 
I mean, what's next on the streets? Because oh. people don't forget. I mean, the people I know don't forget. If it's yeah. a beef, it, it, it might, we might not get you this year. We'll get you at some point. So, so um, I, I, I will say this, me running for mayor has put like a little bit of a buffer, a little bit. Um, and I'm very conscious. Like, I don't go hang out where there's going to be 50 bloods. Like, I don't go to rap concerts where super blood is the headliner or nothing like that. Cause I would have been killed 10 different times. You know, um, I'm very conscious about where I take myself, where I go when I did run for mayor. Um, I had security. I had two armed security guards, um, with me at every, we paid them every public event I went to. I had two armed security guards. No one ever hurt me, disrespected me. And I went to hundreds of events, including debates. And I, I felt perfectly safe. Um, I get a lot of respect in the city, but yet there are some very, very powerful people who don't like me or Julian, and they are still connected to a very powerful blood gang. Um, Denver's a small city, but the Bloods and Crips have been in Denver since the mid eighties. Um, let, let me, let me interrupt you there because there have been threats and there were lawsuits and y you're, you're here. Well, there was one lawsuit, but yeah, <laughs> it did suck. Um, but you know, it was a certain lawsuit. I actually kind of like beat back with the anti slap statute, which was exactly made to defend against these kind of frivolous lawsuits. It was filed by two of these guys who moved into Terrence's office. They said a bunch of things. It was a defamation suit, and it said that a bunch of things were said in the movie that weren't even said, and other things that they said were false that were provably true. And we dropped the lawsuit, but it was unfortunate at the time it was heard, and it lasted about three or four months just to get rid of it. But um, get your email insurance is my advice, even before your festival, because that's that's what it happened happened for us. But I kind of saw that coming, and we did get it actually. But um, anyway, and yeah, that was followed by some. It had proceeded and followed by threats, but yeah, because throughout the reporting of it, I had left Denver a few times um, because of safety concerns. And then there was a very obvious threat on a camera on a Facebook Live by one of the guys who's one of those four guys who moved in and um, is barely in the movie, actually. It's, uh, but anyway, is, 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 a, is a dangerous person who proved himself to be even more dangerous and also to be just, uh, you know, a total... Uh, you know, I'm, in, in, as he's projecting, and I'm just the Joe and the Jewish devil, um, and uh, you know, I was in Kanye West and 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 so forth. But literally, and and um, and saying really ridiculous things. But so that's landed me, yes, in a protection program to, to protect against people. Get this, um, you know, or or can't say for sure, but funded by the city of Denver, and even. You know, Insanely, the current member of Denver. <laughs> well, I should have had I really the one thing I kind of regret not pushing a little bit or making a more point of, and people will never know it when they see it. But the the, the office in yeah. which there was four bloods and only men who took this the spot of chance and they they find it in this federal program. Um, that's the office of the the only office elected office, the current member ever held before he became mayor. He was a state rep. That was his office. That was where all this stuff happened. And despite this, he he had just become mayor in the last year. The movie, this book and movie were all over the city of Denver, all over. And not one journalist asked this candidate, but it was well from London, why did you show this with the leaders of the Bloods? Well, you know, that's the start of things. Um, and uh, anyway, so, 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 uh, so that's yeah, the... yeah, just to put a point on it, the reason it's important though is because what it shows is how a criminal element in a city can really become embedded in the power structure of the city. And he hasn't said anything since is because he's now in their pocket, he's afraid. He's not going to come out and criticize you guys. are dangerous, and that's why. And now they don't have influence in the city through all of this. And anyway, I just think that's, uh, you know, it's for me. Is that the next movie? Well, I think it's, what, yeah. <laughs> I guess it might have to be, I don't know what, like, I have to, but, I, you know, to me, that movie was sort of 
says that, but of course, a lot of what it says are, you know, complex issues that it's eliminating and that aren't probably as, as cool let, as that. Let, let me ask you this, though. So you made a film, you wrote a big book. It's big. So <laughs> that is not normal. Oh, I mean, it's like, that's a tough thing to do. What could you do in a film that you couldn't do in a book? What could you do in a book that you couldn't do in a film? That's a great question. Um, um, because in this case, I was really fortunate. I felt like that I had material that benefited each of those. Um, and I mean, it was part of what I, you know, I feel like to some degree for sure, instinctively understood or thought in terms of making this a documentary was you know, Terrence was a compelling figure. And if he yeah. was going to be a main character, that is important in a film. And I thought that his character and the way he was and what he was going through was extremely illuminating at that time. So I thought that there was an opportunity in a visual medium to actually capture that. And that's what I felt like I was right in the position to do. Um, and in fact, there were times when of course, because of okay, and, and I should talking about this, and you know, the producer is here and we worked on trying to potentially do a series um, on this because, frankly, I mean, there were or was probably enough material. And was, of course, it's not even yeah, to you take, shot like over 500. We kilos. shot so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, long story short, since, you know, we weren't easily finding funding, I think that I just focused on this, like, sort of like, specific line of a story that I could like again you're also leaning of course into your strongest material and I, I would think you know we always have to do but in this case it was this compelling single storyline and the book on the other hand was this multi-generational story um the, the movie is actually the third act of the book um it, it's it's told probably chronologically the book and it's goes all the way back to his, when his grandmother first came from south to the river and it became one of the first people on the way to the Northeast Bay Kill. And in the late 60s, she got there in 50, though, or something, I think, but 50 maybe. But, um, so it's sort of the backstory. Yeah, the backstory of the story of this incredible in neighborhood. Yeah. So it's you know, and, and I had it then, you know, came into this place with some things, and third act is when I arrived. In any case, that was. And they, in this case, really sort of a unique purpose, I would say. Let me add one more point to your question because you're the last person. Um, unless Ali, unless you had a question. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, I get a lot of love from Bloods and Crips for a little while. Like me going even from Denver to Los Angeles was because those guys were well connected and I could have gotten killed in LA too. Um, but since the stories come out, even some of those guys that you see attacking me, I've seen a lot of those younger guys. They've apologized to me because I was working with those guys. Like I was showing them love. I was giving them money out of my own pocket, giving them rides, doing things for them that I probably even shouldn't have done. Nothing illegal or nothing, but just, you know, like here, man, like, you know, those guys were adults and I'm like, here's 40 bucks. You know what I mean? Like those guys were homeless. A lot of those guys, man, like this is not the nineties where big crack boom and epidemic, you know, like those guys were literally standing in the rain. You know what I mean? And these guys are like in their twenties. You know, when, by the time I was in my 20s, I was already selling drugs, out of prison, had kids, I was buying a house. <laughs> These guys were like 23, 24. They reminded me of myself when I was 16 or 17. And I like had a soft spot in my heart, even for Hassan. Like I seen better in him, but he was so easily manipulated. And I knew he had some mental issues, you know, that I maybe thought I could work through. Um, but I get a lot of love in the city. There is like a group of politicians and powerful gang members who... If they caught me out there doing what I like, they would hurt me probably. But there's so much love for me in the city. They did not vote for me to be mayor. Probably a good thing for me. I don't know. Um, but I, everywhere I go, I, I don't feel like I'm in danger. But I don't go into places where I know it's going to be full of those guys. All right. Well, I want to thank you both. Terrence, thank you for letting Joanne into your life for eight years. And... Thank you all for joining us and thanks for out way past the time. All right. Have a good night, everybody. It's a bummer tonight. Be careful. Get them safe. <laughs>